know, in our lives we need panoramas, places where you can get the perspective and the view. We need vista points in our lives where you get to a higher place and you can see the landscape. Physically, of the geography that we're with, it's some of the best geography in the world is right here in the Bay Area. How many have been up to Grizzly Peak? It's up there. And other places. Inspiration Point up at Berkeley in the uh, hills. It's a beautiful, beautiful view from up there. But we need panoramas where we kind of step aside our everydayness, get to a different place, a different, a different view, a different perspective. We can get so into the grind of things. And even if you're retired, you can get into, the re- into those things. Into the grind. And the world in its beauty goes by us and we don't even notice. Our national highway system wisely has engineered vista points, rest stops along the way in our travels. They're good for us. It was a very wise thing to do. The guy that built this church, who was the project manager for this church, was employed by the uh, Caltrans. He was an engineer, and you can see it in this building. If you want to know some more about him, I'll tell you later. He has a rest stop named after him. I think it's on Route 5. But we need those, those times when we're traveling. We need to collect, reflect, inspect, and refresh ourselves. Or we get to what the truckers have known for a long time, road hypnotism. See those lines coming at you on the highway. The world is swirling by you and you don't even see it. We don't need to be hypnotized by the highway of life either. We need to know where we're headed. We need to know who we're with. We know where we're going. We can be driving down Route 5 or some other place. One of the most beautiful places I can remember is driving across the salt flats in Utah. I felt so small. (laughs) And it looked like a big ocean, but the water's that deep across most of the salt flats. But we can get hypnotized by the road and the highway of life as well. You're driving down Route 5 or some other highway, and you can forget the person sitting in the seat next to you. And if we would just collect, reflect, inspect, and refresh, we might look over there and say, my, 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 what a beautiful traveling companion I have. I'm such a blessed person to have this person in my life. But you can have those thoughts. Don't be hypnotized by the highway of life that you don't pull over in the rest stops. We had one here yesterday saying goodbye to Roger. Just before that, Betty, it was so good to get to a vista point where we stop, pull over, take in the view of where we are, who we're with, where we're going, where we've been. How much of your past life do you remember? You say, Pastor, I want to forget most of that, or some of it at least. Oh, it's part of you, it's part of your fabric. And so I would encourage you to take advantage of those times in our lives when we get to the vista points. I hope God doesn't have to slow you down in a way that you're not ready for. But it will either take time or God will make time. If we don't pay attention to our spirit and our body and collect ourselves, our body will send us a bill. And it's expensive to be paid. But in the highway system of the United States, actually, Dwight D. Eisenhower, our president, saw the vision of a, of a national highway system. But then the vision blossomed into 
our great road system. Aren't you so happy for the infrastructure that we have in this country? The great engineer of all of eternity has made pullover places for us. The great engineer of all time and space and eternity, God our Father, has given us vista points in our lives. Take them. Make them for yourself. If it's just walking out into your backyard and watching the sunset, or watching that hummingbird flutter around a blossom, look at the great creation of our Father and what he's done for us. You know, our lives all, aren't all that important anyway. We feel like they are. But they soon pass. The things I'm so concerned about today, tomorrow will be my memory. And then I'm worried about something else that will be my memory. Then I'm worried about something else that will be a memory. Most of it we have little control over anyway. Jesus was like us in every aspect. The Bible says he was made in all points like us. I believe with all of my heart and all of my soul that Jesus needed the rest stops, the vista points, and those emotional breaks as well as we. He said so. He said to his disciples, come apart and rest a while. The Bible tells us, and he drew them aside to a quiet place. Some of us get to the quiet places in the hospital bed. May that not happen for you. I needed the quiet, so he drew me aside into the shadows where we could confide. Away from the hustle where all the day long I worried and hurried when active and strong. I needed the quiet, though at first I rebelled, but gently, so gently, my cross he upheld. And he whispered so sweetly of spiritual things, though weakened in body, my spirit took wings. To heights never dreamed of when active and gay, I needed the quiet. So he drew me away. I want to make my own and, can, and just feel. Jesus needed them. We need them. There were 240 towns, cities, and villages in the day of Jesus. He was driven to go to those places, to see those people, and to give his word and to free the oppressed and heal the sick and hold the children. He was driven. He said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. And so he knew what it was like to be driven to ceaseless activity. But the wise creator of all things, our Lord, the great engineer of all time, pulled over into the rest stops and the vista places. Even while he was visiting those 240 villages, cities, and towns in Palestine, he walked everywhere he went. Now, if Jesus had a Fitbit, he'd beat you all. And how many of you have a Fitbit? I know there are at least two here. He would have racked up some steps, I can tell you that. But Jesus walked everywhere with his disciples. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, and I won't read it again, I'll just, I'll just tell you the story because Diane read it to us a few moments ago. There can be time in the visitation of these villages where Jesus was giving his word of the kingdom of God. He went everywhere saying, the kingdom of God has come to you. Don't we need to hear that? We need to hear to us today, the kingdom of God has come to you. And so he walked, he healed, he blessed but one day, in the mind and heart of Jesus, he saw Nazareth. Luke chapter 4. It says, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. This was a place, the word brought up in the Greek is nourished. This is a place where Jesus got his feet on the ground, and as a young man grew in Joseph's shop. You know, Joseph... The word, we have carpenter. He was the carpenter. Jesus was, actually the word in the Greek is technion. Jesus grew up in Joseph's shop where they could do anything. Fix the plow, build the house, they could do it all. Carpentry was part of it. Stonemasonry was part of it. He could do it all. 
And he was there in Nazareth just plying the trade with Joseph. You don't hear much about him, do you, Joseph? The man in whom God put trust of the custody of his son. Wow. The man who reached into the manger where the animals had picked up God in his hands. Wow. That sends chills up my spine. And I can tell you that Joseph, when he picked up Jesus out of that manger, a protective instinct was born in his soul. I think Joseph was dead by the time Jesus was crucified on the cross. I don't think Joseph could have stood it, being the man that he was, a just man. And so Jesus grew in Nazareth. Jesus thought of Joseph. Jesus thought of his mother Mary. And he had brothers and sisters there. And so he he makes his way back to Nazareth where he had been nourished, where he knew the familiar landscapes, where he knew the synagogue, where he understood, where he had the smell of the bread baking in the bakery, where he could climb the fig tree. He knew where they were and picked the figs. This was his hometown. Have you been back to your hometown? I took Linda to 37 U Street, Washington, D.C., where I spent some formative years in Washington. It didn't look the same. <laughs> it looked smaller. Of course, I was smaller and it was bigger. Now I got bigger and it looked smaller. <laughs> but the nostalgia was still there. I'm sure Jesus felt some of that. The novelist Tom Wolfe said, you can never go back home again. Maybe you can. Maybe you should. Jesus did. And as you go into Nazareth, that's still there, there's a high bluff overlooks the city. This was not a small place. Nazareth was not a dinky little burg. It was not a little farming village. It was a city that had neighborhoods. And Jesus grew up in one of those neighborhoods of Nazareth. Nazareth means the branch, the vine branch. In Jeremiah, it says Jesus will be called a Nazarene. In Jeremiah, in the Old Testament, is a prophecy. Jesus could be called a Nazarene because he was from Nazareth, the place of the branch. He knew the place. And I have no doubt, as you walk into the, the vicinity of Nazareth, Jesus was there and overlooked from that brow of that hill, the whole city, of Nazareth. You can still do it. There's three highways. One goes this way around the city, one goes that way. The trade route, one goes skirts the city. And it was very, it was a hubbub place. But Jesus, I scanned that place and knew every inch. He knew where all the three roads went. He walked on them all. Nazareth probably had 10 or 20,000 people at the time of Christ, they tell us. And so as his custom was, the Bible says, we don't know all that Jesus did in Nazareth. We can kind of think about what he did. I think he once sat under his favorite fig tree, (laughs) place of prayer. Like us, was emotionally charged, felt the at-homeness of Nazareth. Where do you feel at home? I hope so, in your house. (laughs) You feel at home in your house? You know, there are people in our country that don't feel at home in their house. They don't feel at home in their city. They don't feel at home in their country. How sad. I'm at home in America. I felt at home in Fundong, Cameroon. I felt at home at 37U Street. But today, I feel at home right here. It's good. And Jesus needed that and did that. And so... Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as his custom was. It's not like he's, this was his everyday habit now, but as when he lived as a boy in Nazareth, his custom was to go to synagogue. The word synagogue is sunago in the Greek. Soon means together and ago means to come, to come together. We're synagoguing right now. 
And the Bible tells us and history tells us that, that in all of the cities, in the 240 villages, burgs, and towns of Palestine, there was a synagogue. And it was the high, they tried to put, build it on the highest place in the city so it could be seen. But if it couldn't be seen, and it was, they couldn't find a big, they put a big pole up next to the synagogue so you could see where it was. You see that pole in the horizon? Oh, there's the synagogue. And then you might begin to think of the sweetness of the fellowship and the hearing of God's word. The Jews went to synagogue three days a week. Can I get you guys to come to church three days a week? I don't think so. (laughs) But I love it here. But anyway, Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as his custom was. And they knew who he was. He had been known as a teaching, evangelist, prophet, healer, blesser of people all through the town. And the Bible says he went through the cities and towns, I don't know how many, up to 240 he went to, and he was praised by all. I have never gotten that. Jesus was praised by all. And news about him, even without the internet, came to Nazareth. And so when Jesus came to Nazareth from Capernaum or wherever he was coming from, they were waiting for him. What if you knew that Jesus was going to be here next Sunday? Will Willimon is a, one of my favorite preachers, chaplain of Duke University in North Carolina. He tells the story. I'll tell it to you. He's pastoring this church in Greenville, not Greenville, 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 North Carolina. <laughs> and how excited he was, he got, a, he got a telegram that Jesus will be at your church next Sunday. This is just a story now. And so they cleaned the place up, they got the best of everything, they got every cobweb out, they were just waiting for Jesus to show up at... 10 o'clock, people were always coming in the door and the Sunday school was well attended. They had everybody there. And they were just waiting for Jesus to show up in Greenville, North Carolina. 11 o'clock, he's still not there. 12 o'clock, he's still not there. The biscuits are getting cold in the oven. And so about 12.30, quarter to one, people getting to trickle out, he ain't coming today. Well, Will Willimon said, I used to have coffee with the rabbi down the street every Monday. Monday, they're all disappointed Jesus didn't show up. But he's talking to the rabbi. They're having their coffee together on their Monday coffee. And the rabbi says, somebody came to our church Sunday. I think you should know about. And Will Willimon said, well, who's that? He said, he, he said he was from Nazareth. His name was Jesus. And the rabbi says, aren't you Christian? Aren't you the Christian savior? He said, yeah, but I want to come to synagogue today. And they don't speak Hebrew over there. And so I decided to come here. And so he said, well, I'm sorry he didn't show up at your place. But we had a nice talk with Jesus and he went on his way. You know what, beloved? Jesus comes to our church every Sunday. You know, there was a, a young kid in, in uh, a little chapel in West Virginia, and he was 16 year old. He was learning how to preach. I can relate to that. And uh, he was standing in front of the church just like I am, and he looked in the back to the door, and he got pale, and he began to weave. And somebody said, Billy, what's wrong with you? He said, Jesus is walking down the aisle. And the place went hush. What do you think? Is it any more real than Jesus being with us right now? I don't know if he saw Jesus or not, but I know that when we meet together in the name of Jesus, just like he came to that simple synagogue in Palestine, Jesus darkened the door, took his place with the simple people of God, farmers, bakers, tailors, housewives. He was there with them. He's here with us. Can you feel him today? 
And so Jesus is there in Palestine in, the, in Nazareth in his home synagogue, as his custom was. And at the certain part of the service, he stood up, which was an indication he had something to say. And he was so well respected. The attendant, I think his name was Cruzan uh, in the Hebrew, uh, the attendant, he took care of the synagogue, not the, not the rabbi. He went to the cabinet and opened the doors. And very lovingly, he picked up these scrolls. And as custom was, they held them to the breast. And they walked, he walked to Jesus. And Jesus put his arms out and the attendant laid the scrolls in the hands of Jesus. Well, the reading that day was Isaiah 61. And Jesus began to unroll the scroll. Can you see this? I just want you to see this. I want you to see this. There's no electric light. The, lights are, the shafts of light are coming into the slits of windows. And Jesus, the Messiah, is the scroll, and he's unrolling it. He's going like that, unrolling it. And particles of dust are falling in the sun. And you can hear the crinkle of the scroll as it unrolls. They cherish that role. And unrolling it for a long time, he came to the place of Isaiah 61. And he read to them, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the desperate. He sent me to, to heal the brokenhearted. The, the word in the Greek is those people who were broken apart. He has sent me to heal the bruised, to set at liberty those who have been imprisoned. All this was in Isaiah 61, also in Leviticus chapter 25. To give sight to the blind and healing. And Jesus read that passage. And then he rolled the scroll back up and held it to his breast. Walked to the attendant, laid it in his arms. Jesus closed the scroll. That's important. I want you to think about that. He closed the scroll and handed it back. And then he sat down and he said, today, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He says it's in the book. It's in the scroll. But I'm telling you right now, it's in the air. It's in the presence of this room. Jesus closed the scroll and gave it back to the attendant. That didn't close. Some people don't, they, they, they don't have a relationship with God until the Bible's open. Uh, you know, I'm not, no, I gotta be careful with this. Because <laughs> uh, I cherish the Bible. But there comes a moment, there comes a day when you close the book, you set it aside, and you have a personal encounter with God Almighty Himself in actuality. He's not in, only in the book. This day, Jesus said, this scripture is fulfilled in your healing, hearing. This day. And the Bible says the eyes of everyone in that, in that synagogue were fastened on him. They could not stop looking. He's not prouncing around the, the platform like a caged animal. He's just sitting and giving them the fact that the word of God has been fulfilled in their hearing and it's actual today for you. And the Bible says, and, all, and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. I would have liked to know what he said more. I think he explained Isaiah 61 to them in a way that they had never heard. They were familiar with the scroll of Isaiah. They were familiar with Jesus. They had been to the synagogue countless times. They had seen the scroll unrolled. They had seen Joseph. They had seen Mary. They had seen Jesus as a young, as a young child. They knew who he was. They were familiar with him. But their familiarity with Jesus was just the thing that made them not know him. Do you know that you and I can get so familiar with church so familiar with the hymnal, so familiar with the routine, so familiar, we know it all, but we just don't know God himself. They've heard it all. They know it all. I've had every Sunday school lesson known to man. I've seen all the Sunday school pictures. I've heard the sims. I've seen the, the preacher. 
But when those people sat in front of Jesus and he was unrolling that scroll as the dust was falling off and the light was coming in the window, they were anticipating what he was going to say and he blew their minds away. Jesus took that very familiar passage of scripture and gave it a depth of meaning that they had never known before. Do you know that God can open the scripture to you in ways that you have never seen before? It's an exhaustless mine of inspiration. Jesus elevated, broadened, and enhanced that small portion of the scroll they should have known. God told Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to bless the entire world through you. It was all through the Testament, in the Old Testament, on Isaiah. The whole world will be the altar of God Almighty. But these folks, in this small synagogue in Nazareth, had the very Son of God come and be with them. But they couldn't see the greater, the more vast meaning of their own scripture. Religion excludes, God includes. And Jesus opened that scripture to them. What Jesus is, I came to seek and save. Some religious says, I've come to find and destroy. Mm -hmm. We see that in the world today. But he elevated their view. He said, you know, look at your Old Testament. God gave a little woman that wasn't even a Jew, that never been to a synagogue in her life, a miracle. And God gave this, God gave this Nahum, this terrorist military person that could crush Israel any moment, a physical healing of leprosy. They couldn't see that. They couldn't see that God was opening his heart to the world. And he's still doing it. Jesus wants to expand and explode our understanding of his word. It's not narrow. It's not confined. It's not tight. It's wide and open. There's a wideness in God's mercy, the song says. A great wideness in God's mercy. Was that little synagogue important? Of course. Well, is our church important? Of course. But God's program is bigger, greater. Future ages will understand. He challenged their tight little confined theology to a global understanding that God's heart was for the world. After all, he said this, God so loved the world. It's bigger than Pinole Valley Community Church. It's bigger than the little synagogue in Nazareth. We get to participate in it. He exploded their minds. And if the story ended there, it'd be so great. <laughs> but it doesn't end there. First of all, they took offense at him. Hmm, isn't this Joseph's son? We know him. Then they took offense and then they got up. They were going to vote with their feet and leave. And that wasn't enough. They grabbed him and threw him out of town and had him on the brink of a hill and were about to commit murder of the Son of God. But um, I wish I was there, <laughs> really. I wish I could see this. Those religious people are going to kill the Son of God prematurely. He died for them at his time. But the Bible, I could, it's, it's almost like there was a freeze frame they're about to throw Jesus over the cliff and all of a sudden action stops. And Jesus walks right on through them. He's glorious. He's wonderful. The glorious God, the Son of God. Beloved, when we come to church here on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights or any other time, memorial service like yesterday, meet Jesus and have your mind expanded because God is driving us off into the lane to the rest stop, to the vista point. You can see things bigger than they are in the confines of your little mind. I wasn't going to tell you this, but I think I will. I think you'll love me afterwards. <laughs> I was raised by, personal testimony, I was raised by strict Roman Catholic Irish. We went to St. Martin's, all white, Roman Catholic Church on North Capitol Street in Washington, D.C. 
hearing my mother talk, hearing my father talk, and hearing my relatives talk, going to this area, I became a racist. I was a racist. And it creeps up on you. But when I met Jesus in Maysville, Kentucky, and Jesus came into my life, I knew something was going to change. And I knew there would be the day when he would rip that poison out of my soul. It happened. I met some missionaries from Mississippi. Sweet little white gals. <laughs> Want to share Jesus with people. In Melvin. From Mobile, Alabama. My brother in Christ. The black friend, first friend. And after being with him, I could never, ever have a prejudice bone in my soul. Jesus, you know, sometimes it takes time. Jesus will rip that poison out of you. And so when I went to Cameroon with Valentine, I was at home. And so Jesus changes us. He makes us bigger. He makes us more pure. He makes us more global in our vision of what he's doing in the world. I used to be a Baptist. This church is associated with the um, Growing Healthy Churches, and that's associated with the American Baptist, but I don't consider myself a Baptist. I just want to be a Christian. That's all I want to be, made pure by the blood of Jesus. But, you know, the Baptists get together and they say, well, what kind of Baptist are you? I'm a Southern Baptist. What kind of Baptist are you? I'm a Northern Baptist. What kind of Baptist are you? I'm a missionary Baptist. What kind of Baptist are you? Well, since our new pastor came, I'm a stationary Baptist. <laughs> I'm going nowhere. <laughs> we need to get on a move for Christ and know his glory. I'm not going to read these to you. I told you the story. Encounter with Jesus, with reality, Jesus takes people beyond the theoretical into the actual awareness of who he is. It's not only in the book, it's in the air, it's in our souls, and it's in, it's in, the, it's in the kingdom of God in which we live today. Jesus, in that inner encounter with him, with reality, in that little synagogue in Nazareth, he moves people from traditional assumptions to clear insights. He opened that word to them in a way that they had never seen before. I hope you get that here. If this were a bakery, I want you to have fresh bread. He takes us from the traditional assumptions that we have about people that I grew up with and assumptions about religion and about these things and he changes us to give us clear insight into his word. Jesus also our encounter with him, if we were sitting in that synagogue in Nazareth and saw Jesus roll that scroll and, hear the, and read that word to us, he would have taken us from the comfortable ritual to deep affection. You know, every church has, a, every church has ritual, you know that. We have ours. But every, Christ, every church has their rituals, all of them. Every church has a ritual. But when the ritual stays a ritual, it's not reality anymore. God can take the rituals that we have in our lives and give us an adoration and make that ritual mean something so that when the people come up to the platform and open the word of God and read it to us, it's something we adore. It's something so sweet and good to us. It gives us a deep affection. God doesn't want to take all the rituals out of your life and out of your church. He just wants to give you a love at the core of their meaning. In that little synagogue, Jesus took the stationary faith to a sense of uh, journey and joy and adventure. Like I said, they knew the scripture. They knew the synagogue. They knew the rabbi. They knew Jesus. They knew his family, but they didn't know any of it until Jesus enlightened their souls. And they got on an adventure with Jesus. Are you ready to get on the road with Jesus and get with Christ? And so my goal today for you is, is to anticipate meeting Jesus in our synagogue yes. in a new way, 
in having our preconceived ideas exploded into greater, more wonderful things because God is at work in us. Amen. Pray with me.